Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20 is where we begin today. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 20. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Isaiah 10, verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again depend upon him that smote them, but shall stand upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel in truth. Israel is going to learn the hard way that the best way to live is holy. And while you're doing that, trusting in the Lord God, do right and live holy and trust God. That's the only way to be. Now, it might be tempting at times when the heat is on to jump ship and put your trust in someone or something else. But then you're going to become a slave to them. And you don't want to do that. You want to be a slave, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do what is right in his eyes and trust him to take care of you. And if it gets a little scary, because doing right may threaten to cost you something, that's where faith comes in. See, that's where faith comes in. That's where you just have to do what is right. Trust the Lord to take care of you. And when God gets through punishing his people, Israel, because of all of their sins, they will have learned their lesson, a tough lesson, but they'll learn it the hard way. At least they'll learn it. They're not going to rebel, nor will they depend on anyone or anything other than almighty God, which is the way it should have been in the first place. And they could have avoided all this punishment. Verse 21, the remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. And it's not going to be most people. Most of the people are going to die. Most will not survive God's punishment. But a remnant will. The survivors of God's people, as I said, will learn a hard lesson. And the result is going to be repentance. Verse 22. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consuming decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So except for a few survivors, God's people will perish because of their sin. Verse 23, for the Lord God of hosts shall cause a consuming, even determined in the midst of all the land. It's going to happen. Isaiah is delivering this message, and it's not very popular. And the people certainly don't want to hear it. Truth is never popular. And you know what? I don't know if it's just the age that we are living in. But it has been my experience that the truth of God's word in all of its glory is not very popular, even with most professing Christians. And I don't think that's strange. I mean, I think as I look at the Bible and I study the prophets and I look at Moses and the Israelites or all of the Old Testament prophets, with few exceptions, it is only a minority, a remnant of God's professing people that are interested in the pure truth of the word of God. And that's because it's not always pleasant to hear. But here, God says, and this is a tough message for Isaiah to preach to a bunch of rebels, the message is God has decided to punish, and that's not going to change. 
the judgment, the judgment is beginning. And it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Once it starts, it just picks up momentum and you can't stop it. Can souls be saved? Sure. Can you avoid hell? Yes. But you're still going to endure the punishment of God on this planet. And it's not going to be pretty. Verse 24, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt, just like you were punished and suffered, not punished, but suffered at the hands of the Egyptians back years ago. And boy, that rang a bell in their minds because they never forgot that. And he says, now, Assyria is going to do the same thing to you. They're going to be hard on you too. But then he says an interesting thing, doesn't he? He says, don't be afraid of them. You say, well, how, how could they not be afraid when God says they're going to afflict us? They're going to be mean to us. They're going to hurt us badly because they have to look beyond that. They have to recognize that whatever destruction they face, it is God's righteous judgment because of their sin. But, you know, they're still not to fear. Yeah, it's not going to be pleasant. But he says, don't be afraid of those people. Don't be afraid of the Assyrians, even when they're oppressing them. And I think the reason why is going to become clear. Notice verse 25. For yet a very little while, and the indignation shall cease, and mine anger in their destruction. God says, my anger is going to run its course, and I'm going to use Assyria as the rod of my anger, and they're going to tear into you. Because you have sinned against me and you have mocked the word of God. So I am going to use the rod of my anger, Assyria, but then I'm going to destroy them. And yes, many Israelites will die because of their sin. But if they repent, they can at least avoid hell. And, and this is why God said, don't be afraid of the Assyrians. They're going to kill you. They're going to oppress you. It's going to be rough. Many will not survive. But don't be afraid of them. You see, how, how can that be? Because of what Jesus said. Fear not those who can kill the body, but after that can do no more. Fear those who can destroy, fear the one, Jesus said, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So don't fear Assyria. They can't take your soul. Fear God enough to repent and at least get saved so you don't die and go to hell. You're going to die, but you don't have to go to hell. Fear God. Don't fear Assyria. That's going to happen. There's nothing you can do about that. But you better fear God so that you don't jump from the frying pan into the fire after you die. Verse 26, and the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. In other words, God will rescue his people after they've been punished sufficiently. 27, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing, because they were God's people. This isn't going to go on forever. God will end the bondage and the suffering of his people. And it's going to feel like a heavy weight has been lifted off of their back. 28. He has come to Aeth. He has passed 
to Megron, at Michmash, he hath laid up his baggage. And these cities were in the southern part of Israel north. So they were close to the border of Israel north and Israel south, Judah. Verse 29. They are gone over the passage. They have taken up their lodging at Gebi, Geba. Rama is afraid. Gebia of Saul is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard unto Laish, O poor Anathoth. Madmena is removed. The inhabitants of Geban gather themselves to flee. And so the Assyrians had crossed from the north to the south. And the people were obviously terrified. Verse 32. And yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He's only going to go so far. The Assyrians are only going to go so far. God has drawn a line in the sand. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. So he's going to be able to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. The Syrians are going to make it as far as Nob, which is close enough for them to see Jerusalem and shake their fist at it. Verse 33. Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, shall lop the bull with terror, and the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and he shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. When it seems hopeless, God is going to step in, and he's going to cut down the enemy. And that's why they need to trust in him. Let's go into chapter 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Remember, Jesse was the father of David. So he's talking about David, but he's going beyond that. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. In other words, someone from the line of Jesse, who again was the father of King David, talking about the royal line, Someone is going to become king of Israel. And that someone referred to here is the Lord Jesus Christ, whose mother Mary was a descendant of David and Jesse. So what's he going to do? Well, look, it's not so much what he's going to do. That's important. But what he's like and who he is. Notice verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of God isn't going to come and go on Jesus, is what the prediction was. He's, he's going to rest on him. When, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, remember what happened? The Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove and rested on him. That was symbolic of the fact that Jesus had the Holy Spirit in all of his fullness. And he had it every second of his entire life. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And these were all attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ, all these things. He had wisdom, he had understanding, he had counsel, he had might, he had knowledge, and of course he feared the Lord. And that describes Jesus perfectly. Jesus was and he is the perfect man and he's the perfect leader endowed by the Holy Spirit with all of these attributes. Verse 3, still talking about him, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. You know, Jesus's greatest joy was to do what made the Father happy. And that's what it's talking about. And shall make him, Holy Spirit shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. And this goes right along with what the Bible says. God tells us today 
Do not judge according to appearance, but make a righteous judgment. Get the facts before you make a decision. And if somebody accuses someone else, then you make sure you do your homework and get the facts before you come down on one side or the other of that verdict. You know, most people make their decisions based on what they see and what they hear. And Jesus made and makes his decisions based on what pleases the Father and based on what he knows is true. And of course, he knows everything. So he never messes up when it comes to this. Four, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. When Jesus returns, he is going to defend the rights of those who have been abused. He's going to be that kind of a leader. You know, he's going to help the innocent and he's going to punish the bad and justice will no more be perverted. Verse five and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness, the girdle of his reins. In other words, Jesus will rule the world the right way. He will do the correct thing all the time. And sometimes that includes punishing bad people. And sometimes that means helping good people and being good to good people, being bad to bad people, whatever the case, he's going to do the right thing at the right time. Verse six, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Well, that sounds like a different type of earth, doesn't it? It certainly will be. And notice, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Good luck having that happen today. He'd lie down with them, all right, in his stomach. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. Man, these are all natural enemies. These are prey, and they're all going to get along. And the little child is going to lead them? That's what it says. And it goes on, verse 7, and the cow and the bear shall feed. I was in Alaska a few months ago. And a bear took down a moose close to where we were hiking. And uh, so in when Jesus returns in the millennial kingdom, that bear is not going to be a threat to the moose, and the moose isn't going to be a threat to the bear. And it says, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. So there's not going to be any carnivorous creatures animals evidently human beings neither so that's why we're not going to be a threat to one another eight as far as we know anyway there's not going to be any meat eaters verse eight and the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den so the little child is going to be be able to play with the snake so when Jesus returns, he's going to create a new type of earth. And it's going to be perfect harmony across the board. It's going to be pretty much like a restored Garden of Eden, pretty close. And we see from these verses that those who have been natural enemies are going to get along just fine. No person, no animal is going to be afraid of anyone else. Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that's the key. People are going to know the Lord. And that's, not, that's why they're not going to be a threat to each other. Everyone is going to know Jesus. Not just know about him, but know him and love him. And that's one big reason why everyone is going to get along. Verse 10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious. There will be nations on the new earth, 
Some people don't understand that, but that's true. There will be nations, different countries on the new earth, leaders, presidents, kings, whatever the case. But see, the thing that's going to make it different is that they are going to want to serve Jesus. And so will the people. And so they'll visit with Jesus, get to know him better and get directions, and he's going to lead them all. So it's going to be perfect harmony at every level of civil government. Verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed dispersed, I'm sorry, of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So God controls history, and he also controls nations and what they do. And when the time comes, when the time came in the past for Israel to be restored to their land, which it did after the Babylonian captivity of 70 years, nothing could stop it from happening. And the same thing is going to happen when Jesus returns. Verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. And, of course, in case you didn't know, Ephraim and Judah represent the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel. So God unites his people. And when does he do it? Well, when the people are obedient to him. See, that is the key to getting along with others. It's getting along with Jesus. When that's in place, everything else falls into place. You say, well, that's too simplistic. I've been called simplistic. It's not simplistic. It's simple. I can't write a book and charge it 20 bucks to tell you what I just told you. But what I told you is truth. It's not simplistic. It's simple. It works. When people get along with God, they get along with each other. Because you cannot not get along with others if you're getting along with God. Verse 14. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall despoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. When God's people are united, as they will be, they're better able to fight off the attacks of their enemies. So that's not going to be a problem. That's always been the case with Israel. When they were united, man, they were unstoppable. When they followed God, they were united and they were unstoppable. 15. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people who shall be left from Assyria as it was to Israel in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. So we see from this, we're reminded that God not only controls nations but he also controls nature and he can use it to bless his people or to punish his people he blesses them with nature if they are obedient he punishes his disobedient people and if you want to study the word of god further and i certainly hope that you do then i want to remind you of what i said at the beginning of the broadcast and that's that you can go to the scripture verse by verse website and study the entire Bible online. And that can be found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Just go to the BibleVerseByVerse.com, click on the book you want to study, and I always suggest that you start in Genesis. If that's your first visit to my website, click on Genesis. Begin at the beginning and click on Chapter 1, 
and follow along verse by verse as I teach through the entire Bible. And while you are there, if the word of God is a blessing to you, would you prayerfully consider blessing us back? Because this is a faith ministry. I like to remind you that I am not underwritten. I'm not supported by a large church or a denomination. This is strictly a faith ministry. I teach the word of God as I have been doing it 30 years, verse by verse, and I depend on the prayers and the free will offerings of God's people who are blessed and fed by his word. So if you are, you can give in a very secure method at the Bible, verse by verse.com. Just click on the donate button. And again, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead you. That's at the Bible, verse by verse.com. And one more time, the web address for our website is the Bible, verse by verse. Dot com. So thanks for spending this time with me. I'll see you next time right here on Scripture Verse by Verse.